Hey, what's going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Submen's Comics, and we are back with another top 10 back issues for you to be on the lookout for. Again, this list is not just one top 10. All these lists combined make up one master list, which has great issues for you to be on the lookout in those back issue bins. Isn't that right, Jack? That's right, Brian. This is not a reactive list. We're not talking about the top 10 books that have spiked over the last week. We're talking about 10 books to be on the lookout for for the future. We're talking about 10 books that have a great chance of spiking coming up. And now is the time to buy and have those in your collection. Right. And this is the list we created ourselves. One big master list. We break them up in top 10s each week. It's not like we're taking 20, picking 10 out of that from someone else's app. But either way, we're putting 10 picks that make up one great master list. And we're going to get into this week's right now, starting with number 10. And kicking off the list this week, we have The Legends number one from DC Comics. This book has been up there before. It is really down right now, but we still like it because it has that key first appearance of what character, Jack? Well, we're talking Amanda Waller, who is, of course, central to the whole Suicide Squad storyline. And it was really this miniseries that modernized and changed the Suicide Squad into the team that we now know today, which is, of course, this, like, Argus-controlled, a uh, team of prisoners trying to work time off their sentences, doing these suicide missions, all at the order, at the behest of Amanda Waller. And she is really a central and important character in the DC universe. And, you know, with the casting that they had and in kind of well received, you would think that we would see um, more spikes with Amanda Waller because she's a character that can kind of show up in anybody's movie. You could see her in any movie from Batman, Superman, uh, really featured in Suicide Squad. She really can be the Nick Fury of this franchise. But because of that, I think there's a lot of potential. This book is readily available, easy to find. It's a lot easier to find than number three, the first appearance of the, the modern Suicide Squad, which we previously talked about. So this is one to be on the lookout for. Be discerning. Don't pay a lot. But still, it's one to to stash away because I think there's a lot of potential with this character. Yeah, this is a beloved character that was liked on both the TV CW universe and the movie. I think that character kind of carried that movie one as one of the highlight performances in there. Yes. Either way, the movie was kind of so-so, but love this character and love to see what they're going to do with it going forward. You're always going to hear, oh, there's so many copies of this out there. Either way, it's really great price to be had right now, and I would definitely pick it up if you don't have a copy. Next this week, we are talking about Marvel premiere number 28. This gives us that first Legion of Monsters, right? Yeah, and that's the tough thing about um, what's going on right now is we've seen a lot of spikes with key issues, and this is one of them. This book is really spiking right now. And like we've said, we want this list to really be a look into the future. So you may get a little bit scared away by the pricing on this one. This was a book that was readily available for anywhere from $20 to $40, depending on grade and is now pushing towards an 80 to to $100 book. Yeah, especially but, when they started leaking images of like the Morbius uh, movie and right. stuff like that, and people just started speculating, well, this might go towards down the road towards that, and I'm a sucker for yellow covers, so I love this cover as well. Yeah, well, I think the big thing was figuring out who Tyrese was playing, and then now figuring out, okay, so we are going to get a werewolf character, um, and they're really laying the seeds for this Legion of Monsters, and then the elite set photo of um, Jared Leto reading a, a modern Legion of Monsters comic um, really gives so much credence to why this first appearance um, is in demand right now. But I, I think there's so much meat left on the bone here because, you know, you're, you're talking about a Bronze Age key issue. Um, we've seen what other keys from like this era can command, and, and we haven't even scratched the surface. And I really believe in the the horror genre and how successful it can be within the comic book universe. And we've talked before on this list, we said there's going to be certain trends you're going to see. One of which you're going to see is that we're going to be bullish on Sony. We're going to choose to be positive that they've got their thing figured out and that they can get things rolling with uh, Morbius and Jared Leto is going to kill that role. And it's only going to spawn future projects in relation. So we saw that with our pick of Venom Enemy Within. We're saying that right now with Legion of Monsters. 
Then hitting us at that number eight spot this week, we get champions number one. Now, we're not talking about the 2016 or those later ones. We're talking about the OG champions number one. And why is that, Jack? Well, mostly because of the, the 2016 to current. We've seen Marvel push champions. Champions as a brand, champions as a team, champions um, kind of as a, a unit. And this has kind of reignited some interest in that original champions number one, which is, of course, the first appearance of the team. And the thing about this is Marvel's got a lot of plans coming up for their upcoming publishing schedule. And we've already kind of seen how this works. Whenever they've pushed champions hard, that champions number one starts to get popular. We see spikes. So this is really an easy short-term predictor. One of the skills that you can kind of employ is to be able to look at what has happened in the past and at least get kind of a predicting factor on what a book's profit potential is based on where it's sitting today. And this is one of those examples. And in the short term, because we know that they're going to have this whole um, storyline going on with the champions and all the young teams with the outlaw team superheroes and that whole outlawed series. And that's coming up as soon as we get this whole new comic thing back rolling again, people are going to be sure to be talking about this issue. So be on the lookout for this one. Be discerning. Don't pay a lot, but it's one that has a lot of potential. Then next this week, we're going to that classic New 52. We're going to that Scott Snyder story. We're going with Batman. Of course, we're going with those early issues with the trifecta of issues number two, three, and six. That's right. We get the first appearance of Talon, but we get an awesome storyline. And what else is going on with these issues? Well, this is the first of two picks where we're going to see kind of a grouping of issues because you really can't talk about one without talking about the other. And here we're talking about this early New 52 Scott Snyder run and the introduction of the Court of Owls and everything related to it. So in issue two, we get the first appearance of Talon. Now, this is like the big character creation in the early part of the run um, for Scott Snyder. Talon was an extremely cool character. It's a character that's gone totally under the radar, really never gained a ton of heat, Um, even though pretty widely received as like a cool character within the Batman title. Everyone thought the character came off cool in the animated film. Everyone thought the character came off cool in in what had some solid reader buzz from those who read the Scott Snyder Talon series, which a lot a lot of people don't even realize that Scott Snyder wrote that series. But that you know, if you haven't read that, I would absolutely recommend checking that out. And because of all of that, it, we talk about how it's inevitable that we're going to see Court of Owls in a film at some point, and I think that that is a slam dunk. So issue number three, the first appearance of the Court of Owls, and issue number six. The first, appear- the first full appearance or whatever. And this is why I put it on the list because we don't want to play comics politics. We always tell you the same thing. Just get them both. If you can grab three and six, you, you hedge your bet. You let other people argue. You sell to both camps and you're doing great. But they can't really do Court of Owls without Talon. Or, I mean, they can, but it's just not going to be the same thing. It, it, it gives it that added edge. So that's why I think two has a lot of value and gets overlooked when people are are kind of paying attention to these court of owls books, but the beauty of kind of the, where the market is, is the, the, the market is softened on these new 52 issues. And because we know long Halloween is the next film that the Batman franchise is going to be focused on. We have some time to start grabbing these Batman keys and aiming towards the future. So fingers crossed, Robert Pattinson kills this next movie and that we can get a good, slate of Batman films, but I can't imagine them going too far without hitting the quarter vowels. Coming in at midway on that list, we get that Neil Gaiman classic, and we're talking about Sandman number one. This is an issue that a lot of people are aware of, but it makes for a great back issue to add to your pull list nonetheless, right? Yeah, it's one that I think you've always kind of had to have. You know, if, if you're looking at kind of like I'm a comic book collector and I want to have like all the like really important issues. Yeah. People when I, go, oh, you don't have Sam in you. Right. When, when I got back into collecting um, certain issues, you just had to have with Hellblazer one. You had to have Sandman one. You had to have Watchmen one. Next Man 21. You know, you had to have these major keys that just really transformed comics. Um, but forever there's been talk about Sandman being adapted in some way and there's yeah jay gordon levitt was trying to do it right right so much struggle and and you know 
Jason, Joseph Gordon-Levitt was really open about the difficulty that he faced with the, just the way that that story is written to try to really bring it to life and the difficulty. But in the process, what have we seen? Well, we have seen a lot of the Sandman run start to be adapted in other forms. We've seen issue number four pop because the Lucifer television show, while it got canceled, was so popular, it got demanded to be brought back and it got second life on Netflix. We've seen issue 22, the first appearance of Mazikeen, pop because of that show, as well as being the first appearance of Daniel the Endless, who then appeared in continuity in DC Comics and reignited that issue. But issue number one gets overlooked. The first appearance of Morpheus, the first appearance of the title and the brand in general, which I think is an undervalued point these days in the hobby. Um, and while this is still a book that can command as much as like $100 and be a wall book, it's also a book I see regularly in boxes. We talk about the difference between the books on the wall and the books and the boxes on the table, it's one that I will regularly find in the boxes on the table for like $40 in that kind of like 9-0 shape. I think that's a great buy. But in the meantime, they've hired this all-star cast headlined by James McAvoy to do a audio adaptation, which we know that our friends over at Vault Comics have, have really kind of pioneered the audio comic book. And with the success of audio books today, I really think that could be a major wave of the future. Add in an uh, all-star cast, reading your favorite comic books in, in dramatic style, I think that that could do uh, something to expose comics to a new, a new market. But while that won't move the needle on the secondary market, the point is that Sandman is going to get in front of a lot of new people, and that is surely going to spike books. Yeah, what's old is new again, right? Back in Absolutely. The our, our pappies used to listen to radio shows. Now we got people listening to audio shows of comic books, which is great. And I like to also let us know in the comments, do you have a copy of Sandman number one? Or do you want a copy of Sandman number one is one of the books that you're hunting for? Or even so, the Sandman not move the needle for you at all and you could care less. But we're halfway through the list. Do us a favor, click that thumbs up button for us. And if you know someone that could benefit from watching the, this, this video, wanting to add those books to their pool list at any time, do us a favor, share this video out to them. And we're gonna get right on into number five. And then hitting us at that midway spot at number five, this is an issue that a lot of people were hunting for about five years ago. And we were talking about DC Presents number 26. This is still a great book. It's died down just a little bit, but there are still people hunting for it. And why is this such a great book, Jack? Well, of course, we're talking about the first appearance of the Teen Titans as we know them today. Those new Teen Titans we're talking about, first appearance of uh, Cyborg, first appearance of Raven, uh, um, Starfire. Yeah, first appearance of Starfire. We're talking, this is really going to kick off what we really know of Teen Titans, Marv Wolfman, George Perez, um, and everything that would come forth. This is really a massively underrated book uh, because you can't kind of undervalue the fact that you really don't have Teen Titans without those characters that we named. I know that they, the Teen Titans as a team existed before, but you're never going to see an incarnation of Teen Titans in any sort of adaptation without those characters kind of front and center. Now, we've got the television show going on right now. And you know what? It's a good show, but it's on a DC Universe app, which I think at some point we have to, you know, you call do it. like Doom Patrol where it's going to like, oh, it's on DC Universe, but it's on HBO Max. Yeah, but you just got to call it what it is. Brian, man, RIP. Like, that, nothing on that app is ever going to really move that the truly is the walking dead yeah it's not going to move the market but i think what it shows is the validity of the characters the way that you can tell these stories i was shocked we got like a live action trigon um they did so much right you can nitpick some things they did wrong but they've done so much right there. yeah it's a great show i'm enjoying yeah it. and in so this is really like their X-Men. We saw that with the classic crossover, um, you know, way back when with Claremont. And, and they kind of crossed over those two key books for DC and Marvel. Um, and if you kind of make that comparison, you start to realize like just how grossly undervalued this book is. And sure, there's a difference in accessibility. But at the same point, uh, that just to me shows the potential. The other interesting thing is that this book is a preview book, really, that this is one of the first of those true first type first appearances. Um, this previewed 
New Teen Titans number one from 1980, uh, which is a book that I think is actually largely undervalued because the fact that this is a, a preview book, you know, not that there should be another book considered a first appearance. We're not playing the politics game, but I, I think that number one is undervalued and a great book to grab to go along with that DC Percents 26. So inching just outside the top three, coming at number four, we have Avenging Spider-Man number nine. There's another book that was super hot a few years ago, especially leading up to that first Captain Marvel movie. But that's why we have it on this list, because I think it's a great opportunity to pick it up now, because people are lulled to sleep about Captain Marvel and where we're going Absolutely. with the MCU. Yeah, and here's the thing, man. We talked earlier in this episode, and we've talked about it on every episode, about one of like those things that we look for, again, being that past profit indicating future profit. Do you remember, Brian, what this book sat at when that movie was releasing? I know I sold my copy early, and there was a lot of room for growth. I know it was going for like nine eights were going for like $1,000 at one point. Yeah. Raws were at like 400. So sitting right now at 100, I sit there and go, well, I've got like four times ROI sitting right there available for me. Um, and, even, and even if it doesn't hit the same target, I mean, think even if you came in short, even if you went to 250, you'd still be really happy with that. Um, I think this is one of the most slam dunk easy investments you can make right now yeah and we already know feige loves this character we know feige loves this character we know this character is going to be front and center of the mcu and really entrenched in several other properties i think you're going to see her effect all over the mcu um people can feel however they want to feel about the actress who portrays the character regardless the character has been front and center in every initiative marvel's done um, on the publishing side, on the film side, over the last few years. And there's been such an increased heat in the um, kind of reader buzz in the comic series. It really gives me hope for that future, the future of that franchise. The second print is another book to be on the lookout for, Sketch Cover, uh, selling for about $80 right now. This is another book that was selling for like $250, $300. Um, and, and it's really a tougher find than that first print, so it's one to be on the lookout for. Yeah, and we, if the rumors are true, there's a pretty big WWE star that's lined up to also appear in these movies, right? Yeah, yeah. A lot of strong rumors about Becky Lynch playing Rogue and, and coming into this film with all of that rumor about that whole Rogue versus Carol Danvers kind of storyline. So a lot of excitement there, a lot to be on the lookout for. So like I said, this is a no-brainer one. This is a blue chip. So we made it into the top three, and coming in at number three, we have Justice League of America number 64, which gives us that first appearance of that second Red Tornado, right? Right. You're getting that Silver Age Red Tornado, that new origin. I've noticed a couple trends going on, Brian. I really think these first Silver Age characters are going to see their, their day because a lot of these original first appearances for these types of characters are just far beyond you know anything anyone can afford. Especially with DC Time. Yes, specifically with DC. And then a lot of these characters further have been changed so much from their original incarnation with DC Comics that by the time that we see them, say, on the big screen or on a television screen, streaming service, um, you're not going to see that character. So people want to find what's the first appearance of that character, the one that I'm going to see. And if you're thinking Red Tornado, this is really the book to get. Now, not the cheapest book in the world, but at the same point, massively undervalued when you start kind of comparing to like Mr. Miracle and you got to look at what's going on, right? You got vision popping with Marvel. You've got Mr. Miracle popping with DC as we head towards this, uh, you know, new gods movie where I will say you could see red tornado, but even if you don't see red tornado there, we know that eventually, um, DC wants to get some sort of Justice League program going. This is definitely a future pick, but this is a character that if Red Tornado shows up, um, you, you, this book could be going for big, big, big money being the fact that it's a Silver Age first appearance. But grab this one now. Don't be afraid to grab those mid-grade uh, to lower mid-grades, um, you know, to stack up a few copies. If you've ever seen the um, 
the you know the young justice cartoons some of the stories involving red tornado tio moro were really interesting i think tio moro would make an amazing villain in the dc universe and that would easily bring in red tornado so this one is is a good vintage book um one that i don't hear a lot of people talking about um and that may be why people may down this pick but we did not hear people talking about mr miracle like this a few years ago but look where we are today. Jack just mentioned Mr. Miracle and coming in at our second to top spot at the number two, we have another trifecta. We're talking about Mr. Miracle volume one issues, number two, four, and six. Why is this Jack? Well, first off this one, this is a slam dunk. We talked before about maybe this could show up in the new gods movie. All of these issues, we know these characters are coming yeah, in this upcoming, yeah, in this upcoming Tom King um, New Gods movie, which again is another trend that you're going to see. We're very bullish about this New Gods movie being written by a comic book writer, being written by the writer who really sparked these characters. Um, I think that you're going to see a real true to comics form film, uh, and that is going to do really well for comic investors who are investing in those tie-in comics. So here you're getting the first appearance of Big Barda, Granny Goodness, the Female Furies. And these are three different first appearances that are going to be very prevalent within this film. Now there's others, there's other books out there, but these are the three that I really highlight as ones that have spiked and spiked to high prices and are really now just undervalued. I was literally at a convention when news broke about uh, these specific characters being in the film, and I saw the 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 absolute fury going around the the convention floor, and I actually was able to grab a couple books. Didn't even negotiate price; grabbed them off the wall at whatever the dealers wanted for them. I was going to bring them home. I had them sitting uh, back behind my wall, and so many people kept asking me for these books. I ended up selling them that day for about three times what I paid for them. It was absolutely amazing. Now I go check on these books and you're talking about 20% of what they were selling for at the time of that news. So this is just the spec cycle that has been slowed down to an absolute crawl because of the pandemic. It will heat back up again. So we are down to that top spot. And real quick, before we get into that pick, we just want to let you know, as always, this full list, you can also find it at simplemanscomics.com. We have a little bit more information about each one of these books as well, as well as links to where you can find available copies on eBay. And we also want to give a big shout out to our channel sponsors. Shout out to Slabbed Heroes, where you can get those great guaranteed 9.8s at slabbedheroes.com. And of course, if we're talking 9.8s, we have to shout out our brand new channel sponsor and the number one grading company in comics grading, CBCS. If you're sending in those CBCS submission forms, make sure you're putting Simplements Comics at the top of that submission form so you can save 15% by the end of May. And we want to send a big shout out to Frankie's Comics and Frankie'sComics.com, dropping the hottest exclusive variant covers on the comics market. And with that being said, we give you the top back issue this week, and we are talking about Marvel premiere number 47. Yes, a lot of these books peaked a while back, but they're down there. Right now, great buying opportunities before that cycle kicks back around and brings these back up in the heated of the moment. So this is great buying opportunity. Marvel premiere number 47, we have some great first appearances. Everyone's all like, yes, you're aware of Scott Lang as the first appearance of Ant-Man, but we also have Cassie Lang, and we also get Darren Cross in this book. Yeah, so this is one of, in my opinion, the most overlooked books in comics, and that's why it's got to sit on this number one spot. Now, you mentioned, of course, books that were up and now are down, and that is, of course, one of those trends that you are going to see throughout this list and future lists, and it really applies here. But also, we talked about kind of like with Teen Titans, the elevated importance of that character. Ant-Man is an Avenger, Brian. We are talking front and center. We're talking Infinity War, Endgame. He was there for Civil War, and he's going to be there going forward. Paul and Rudd. you never know what's going to go on with Cassie Lang. No, absolutely not. I haven't even gotten into that yet. But Paul Rudd is a major actor. Major actor. We're not talking about a B-list, C-list. We're talking about a major actor. You look at all of the first appearances of any of the uh, major Avengers characters, and it just pales in comparison. I mean, 
Marvel Premier 47 is beyond undervalued when you start looking at that team. Especially and, when you look at this generation, to them, Scott Lang is Ant-Man. They don't, Hank Pym's just some old guy. The old guy, right. So, so I think that, that when the movie first got announced, there was kind of still some, some of those old heads kind of fighting that. And there was also some people trying to kind of push that Robert Kirkman, uh, irresistible Ant-Man. That irredeemable. Out, irredeemable that came out later and had a different character as Ant-Man. But Scott Lang is the Ant-Man. Being in the MCU, how big and iconic and just the scope of those films. He is, was, and always will be the only Ant-Man that matters until that person you mentioned, Cassie Lang. When she becomes Stinger, uh, that's kind of the key to the future. We saw with that five-year age up with, within uh, Endgame, that really is going to change everything. And there's all this talk about this Young Avengers issue or this issue with Cassie Lang, and everybody forgets her real first appearance um, before she became any sort of character. It happened right here in this issue. And here's the other thing. She may... We've seen the Marvel Universe kind of change some of the comic story a little bit. She could be Ant-Man. And if that's the case, that would happen right there. She could be the next Wasp. Uh, regardless, this is the one issue where you know this is her first appearance on top of Scott Lang's first appearance. Great issue. Uh, and, and just so undervalued. Tough book in good shape with that black cover. Don't be scared of the, uh, mid-grade books. Don't be scared to stack up a few of those mid to lows. And don't be scared to, if you're on a budget, grab what you can afford and then move up uh, as you go. Yeah, and you mentioned Cassie Lang also. You never know. You always hear rumors about it. But what if they do an A-Force movie? Everything in the MCU could be changed up so they could switch those characters up in for that. Yep. I think there's only a matter of time before you have like an all female superhero movie. People are chomping at the bit for it. Some people don't want it, but either way, there's something keeping them back in the mind. Just might be a reach, but you never know. Yeah. See, you say it might be a reach, but my, I, my daughter just watched Endgame this weekend. And the one scene that resonated more than any other is when all of those female superheroes, which made people go out and buy a force books too. <laughs> yeah, it really did. It really did. But that one scene blew her mind. And just seeing that look on her face made me say that movie would work. Yep. So there it is guys. This week's top 10 back issues. Again, we say each week, put this list in your notebook because they all accumulate into one great list to be on the lookout for, for these back issues. Let us know in the comments, how many of these books do you have? What do you think of this list? What do you think should be on a back issue top 10 list? We have next few weeks written out already, but we're always adding to them because it's a living list as Jack says, right? Absolutely. Constantly growing, constantly evolving, and always with an eye to the future of the comic market. So this is Jackie Bryan from Superman's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video. When you've had enough, when the crowd gets rough, gotta stand up.